Okay, so I one, I swear. I swear I'm the same guy as the picture at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what a PhD can do to you. <laughs> um, so, you see, this is an, an updated version of, um, of, of a tutorial we did in, in, in August in ISMIR. Uh, it's, a, it's a conference for music information retrieval. So, um, we thought that it would be very, it, it was very important to have like a kind of a, um, let's say, beginner-friendly introduction to NFP, even if we didn't know what we were going to find. Um, so a lot of concepts that you see here, many of you in the audience may, may already know, but, um, but uh, we hope that still it's uh, entertaining for you. Uh, okay, so I'm going to start with um, yeah, a loose definition of what is natural language processing and uh, breaking it down in uh, well, two types of tasks, what we call the the, the core tasks in NLP, so any type of intelligent uh, text processing that you that you have to do uh, automatically, at least is going to uh, rely on some, if not all, of these uh, core tasks. And then the applications are these uh, intelligent uh, things that you can do with text um, based on, on, on these uh, core tasks. Then, um, as Sergio said, since we work a lot on semantics, we rely a lot on, on knowledge repository. So. Uh, digital places where you put knowledge and then you can use them for improving artificial intelligence tasks, uh, inference, reasoning, or in this, or in this case, uh, music information retrieval, and at the end, a lot of uh, resources, references, etc. So, let's, um, let's start with a definition. So, NLP is a field of computer science and artificial intelligence concerned with the interaction between computers and human natural language. Um, it's believed that Alan Turing's paper, Computing Machinery and Intelligence, uh, was the first uh, proper NLP paper. Uh, it stated that the computer could be considered intelligent if it could carry on a conversation with a human being without the human realizing that he or she was already talking to a machine. Um, from there, things have uh, uh, well, evolved a lot. Um, and when, well, realistically, when we speak about natural language processing, in 90% plus of the cases, we speak about English processing because it's the lingua franca of research, uh, commerce, uh, well, uh, entertainment, etc., etc. But I mean, this reality in terms of research and industry doesn't really need to reflect the reality of the world. In the world, there are more than 7,000 languages, and a language, <coughs> as we all know, it's not simply a collection of words with associated meanings that then you put together and then you sum the meaning, and that's what you have. A language is something that is much more complex. Um, they bear social and cultural traces. They are uh, chronologically sensible, like this meaning that the Spanish, Catalan, or English that we speak to today has nothing to do with the language that was spoken uh, uh, a few hundred years back, and it's going to be probably uh, change a lot, uh, changing a lot uh, during the years. And these, uh, well, these uh, particularities of the language is something that for automatic systems is difficult to, to cope with. Um, but this is what makes language beautiful, right? So this is why we have figurative language, humor, jokes, <coughs> and we have a lot of fun with language. But it's also because uh, this is the reason also why uh, language has been not uh, treated uh, with a lot of success in many aspects up to now in artificial intelligence, because the meaning is not explicitly stated in words. Um, and in fact, if you look at, have a look at this quote, but this is from a Wired article in 2013. They said the future for the most, in the future, the most useful data will be the kind that was too unstructured to be used in the past. So processing language actually has a lot of value, but it has value because it's difficult. If it was easy, it would have been a solved problem, and it's far from being a solved problem today. Um, and still, we still use NLP uh, all, every day, even if we don't really realize. It's present in web searches, speech recognition and synthesis, automatic summaries in the web, product, including music recommendation, machine translation, etc., etc., etc. So there's a, there's a very classic book by uh, those who study NLP by uh, Jurafsky and, and, and Martin. It's called Speech and, and Language Processing, and, and they said that uh, even if it, look, if it comes as a surprise to many, uh, uh, doing some kind of automatic processing in text, at some point you have to resolve an ambiguity of any kind. A 
morphologic, morphological ambiguity, lexical, syntactic, discourse, communicative. Ambiguity is the key of why uh, uh, natural language is difficult. And, um, well, considering the audience and considering the, 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 the context in which this talk is being given, if you read this sentence, I expect most of you to picture you know, this kind of representation in your head because, you know, there are certain uh, uh, non-tangible characteristics of our communicative context that lead you to, to, to read that. But actually, if you only read the sentence, there's absolutely no way that you would understand something completely different. <laughs> and the reason for this is what we call lexical ambiguity. No? So we have words that have several meanings, and an, an intelligent system has to okay, go by word and say, OK, this word is ambiguous, but what am I going to do with this? No? Right? Um, and another important aspect in natural language processing is that it's not a large, uniform task. You don't think, all right, so it's time for research, so I'm going to do an NLP paper in general. Well, that doesn't work that way. Because as I said, processing language is difficult enough, so we uh, follow the divide and conquer approach. It's, uh, you, have, you can break it down in smaller and more tractable <coughs> programs, and then you try to do the uh, data set, and you, get, uh, and you may advance that specific subtask in NLP, which then you can you know, uh, apply to other tasks. Uh, there's a, Another quote that I'd like to read is from Colbert and colleagues from 2011, but the reality today is pretty much the same. They said, will a computer program ever be able to convert a piece of English text into a programmer-friendly data structure that describes the meaning of the natural language text? Unfortunately, no consensus has emerged about the form or even the existence of such a data structure. So if we don't even agree in the community, in the end of the community, whether there should exist a data structure or a formal way to represent language as a whole, it makes sense to continue breaking down language in smaller tasks. So we're going to start with the, um, uh, what we would call core natural language processing task. And the first one is the part of the study. Again, I mean, this could be called a, a custom list of very important tasks in NLP uh, selected by Luis. This is no a universal truth, but I believe that most researchers in the area would agree with me, maybe take one or add one, uh, but in general it's more or less kind of fixed. Uh, so in part of speech signing, what you have to do is to resolve uh, this ambiguity in terms of, uh, well, you have to know the grammatical category of each of the words appearing in your text. In this way, um, well, you can uh, uh, apply this information to further uh, downstream applications, for example, in parsing, then you can know which, who is the subject, who is performing an action, and who is receiving that action, or you can uh, do other things which are, uh, which are based on this information, right? Um, so in this case, for example, in the sentence I like just music, it's like being alive for a second. We have two occurrences of the, verb, of the word like, but if one of them is a verb, the other one is an, uh, a position. So, you know, by having this part of speech, we know that the first like is different from the second. And for us, since we are going to work with statistic, statistics, that's good enough. Um, as I said, uh, who's, the, who's the subject and who's the, uh, the, the recipient of the action, right? So this now we come to a, a little bit more of, of, of uh, one level up in the scale of linguistic description. And we're going to speak about syntax. So if you look at this sentence, this is a joke eh, for, to start with. And, and this is because sometimes some people don't find it funny, but it's a joke. So one morning I shot an elephant in my pajamas. How he got into my pajamas, I'll never know. So the reason why this is funny is because the author is playing with the fact that you don't really know in my pajamas if this is a, if this is a prepositional phrase, but uh, on paper you don't really know whether it's modifying elephant or it's modifying I. There's nothing in the ex explicitly in the sentence telling you what. Uh, you know because you expect a person to be wearing a pajamas, and that's where the joke comes in. So he says, no, it was the elephant that was wearing the pajamas. So this is kind of ambiguity, it's called syntactic ambiguity, and you resolve it by drawing uh, syntactic tricks where you can then uh, uh, know which words are more important than others because they are <coughs> important words tend to appear at the top of the syntactic tree and lesser words we could say appear at the, at the bottom, so prepositions, conjunctions, or other kinds of modifiers. And uh, well, um, and uh, there are two main paradigms for uh, syntactic parsing in NLP. One of them is consequency parsing. The main uh, idea is that uh, you can 
um, draw the syntax of a sentence by means of uh, drawing words in terms of as notes, and you also have super notes, phrasal notes that subsume other words. So you have a super note here, which is a verb phrase that uh, well is is is, is uh, containing a whole long phrase like shot and elephant in my town. Realistically, in natural language processing, we prefer, or at least the tendency is going uh, on the on the side of dependency parsing, where you essentially get rid of phrasal notes. So there are no as notes that subsume others in terms of a phrase. Um, each note is a word. Relations are bilexical, so there's one relation, a relation one to one, and the, the idea is more or less the same. So you have important words at the top of the syntactic tree and at the bottom uh, modifiers and so on. Um, and that's, that's, this is an extremely difficult, even from the computational side, but also from the, from the linguistic side, uh, to, to, to do. So I, I think it's enough to, to, to know this uh, at this stage. Then one, one step further in parsing is what we would call semantic parsing. This is mostly used to, tri to treat verbs. And I'm going to give you an example from Propag. It's a fairly known uh, resource in this sense. Um, so the idea is that for every verb and for every sense of that verb, you expect arguments as a kind of slots that have to be filled, <coughs> sorry, that have to be filled by the information that appears in the sentence. So this is a, this is giving you a little bit more of information than, than the syntax, the regular syntax that we've seen earlier, than the morphology. In the sentence, uh, Mary left the room, the argument zero would be the entity who is living, and the argument one would be the place is being left. So this sense of living expects two arguments. But in the sentence, Mary left her daughter, her parents, the sense of living has another connotation. So here, the arguments are in number. They are different, but they are also different. So it's, it's this sense of living expects a, give, expects a giver, a thing which is given, and a beneficiary. Then um, you can, another, uh, Important task in NLP is name identity recognition. So not everything in the in, can have a grammatical category because things are can be uh, proper nouns. <coughs> um, traditionally, the idea was to uh, work with <coughs> generic types. Name identity recognition is taking a text as input and go word by word and identify the, the, the offset, the snippet of text that is referring to a name identity. And traditionally, these name identities were well defined as persons, locations, or organizations, and in some cases, currency, dollars, euros, etc., and dates, and that was it. But this is a very flexible task, so you can actually formulate it a little bit and say, okay, we need name identity recognition in the music domain. And I look specifically into bands, music genres, artists, or other uh, types of entities that may be useful then for another application in which I want to use uh, this information. Another example of a very important task at the discourse level in natural language processing is for reference resolution. So your algorithm not only has to read the text word by word and you know drawing, knowing the, the morphology and the syntax and the semantics and, and knowing whether there are name entities or not, but also kind of keeping track of mentions to entities that have been already mentioned, which is called anaphora. And here, uh, in the sentence, I voted for Nader because he was most aligned with my values, she said. Your algorithm has to know that she, my, and I are referring to the same entity because in the, in the third mention there might appear a very important bit of information that you don't want to miss. And you can't expect every mention to an entity to be explicitly stated. And then Nader and he, another entity. So this is, a, a, if we are speaking about difficult tasks, this is one uh, that is uh, one of the most, I would say. Then you have word surface ambiguation. This is the same case as the this is the same case as the as the music uh, the metal fan uh, joke. That was also a joke. The performance of that bass player was outstanding. And yeah, of course, right. So you have bass as a, the musical sense and bass the, 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 the fish sense. Now your word surface ambiguation system should look at a word that is ambiguous, and then it has to leverage, it has to exploit some kind of contextual information like, like we do to decide this seems to be the music sense. 
if you only simply by looking at the sentence we see that performance and player, you know, we have a few words that if we knew what these were, we would probably say, okay, this seems to be a sentence where bass has the, the music sense and not the and not the fish. Okay, so now this should cover most, if not all, of the core tasks in NLP. And then you can use the information you get from here to do the very nice intelligent applications, like for example, summarization. Summarization is basically reducing the size of a document, but keeping the most important information. In NLP, we work with two types of, of summaries. Extractive summarization, where we simply select the most important sentences in a set in a document or in a corpus and we put them together in another document after getting rid of the, of the redundancy of things that are not important. The abstract summar summarization has one additional module on generation. So not only you select important information, but then to make everything more readable, uh, you have a natural language generation module that puts together sentences, as for references, and well, makes it everything more natural and more fluent to the reader. Summarization can be multi-document summarization, so you take a bunch of documents as input and output one single document with the important information across all of them. Or single document summarization, where you have one document and you generate, you derive a small version. Author profiling is another uh, very interesting uh, task, which is uh, revealing demographic traces behind the writers of a message, also known as digital text forensics. So give me a text as input and my algorithm might say whether the mother language of this writer of English text was English, uh, Spanish, or that. This is actually a the, the, uh, bit of the format from a challenge in, in, in author profiling. Um, so this is what is expected from the systems to also predict the age group of the writer of the, of the text or whether he was a male or a female. This has clear applications in plagiarism detection, cybersecurity. So industrial, industri industry wise, this is a very nice field to work in because there is a lot of interest by public institutions, etc. Machine translation is like, well, the text <coughs> natural language processing task, right? Sometimes when you are asked, what do you do? Yeah, you teach computers how to speak and how to understand you and how to, it's difficult to explain, but when you say machine translation, pretty much everybody understands what you're doing. Um, and the task, in fact, is very simple. Uh, from, lang from a text in language one, you have to derive a text in language two, preserving the meaning. And this is what the difficulty does. Um, it was originally approached as a rule-based uh, task, but today, statistical approaches now clearly have uh, taken over. Um, still, Apertium is one of the best known uh, rule-based machine translation systems, so I thought it was worth uh, mentioning it, at least. Uh, for 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 statistical machine translation, you need parallel corpora. So you need a statistical model that looks at a bunch of parallel sentences, parallel texts, and learns what is a kind of transformation or translation or however you want to call it uh, from language one to language two. The problem, uh, the, you, we have a, today a lot of data, so this is good, but it comes with other challenges. For example, sentence or word or phrase alignment. So there are many cases where um, Languages are not in the same order, so it's difficult to align, for example, uh, English and Arabic. Uh, statistical anomalies, so in a language there may be things that are very rare, but still very important, so you have to account for that, so the statistical model has to be sensitive to things that are important. Um, idioms, collocations, phrasal uh, compounds, um, and multi-word expressions, uh, also different word orders, or out of vocabulary words. So what would a, a statistical machine translation system do with the word selfie when it was starting to be used, right? So what do you do with things that it's the first time I see them? So you have to come for, for that. And finally, sentiment analysis. Sentiment analysis, as it now says, is a computational study of sentiment. So you want to know, given a piece of text, what is the, the, the polarity of that text? What is the stance of the author? If the author is happy or sad or angry or intrigued about a certain piece of, of text, usually this is done for music, for uh, reviews, product reviews, activity in social networks. And this is another task with a lot, with a very strong applications in the industry. Because me as a company, I'm interested in knowing uh, whether people are speaking well or bad about my product in social networks 
or people or as an investor I want to know uh, the probability of a certain stock or, or, or a certain company to do well in the stock market and maybe with information about how it fares with the community I can get a little bit of an insight from there. Of course it's very difficult like everything that has to do with language. This can be, go read the book, this can be an extremely positive review for a book and an extremely negative review for the movie that was based on the book. So uh, if you think about it, not changing one single character, we have two uh, opposite uh, scenarios. So what do you do? You have to look at the context, you have to consider the, maybe the profile of the user. Uh, here is where we as practitioners have to be imaginative, right? Uh, <coughs> And yeah, I could have gone on and on, but uh, I think that's that's really fine for you know having a more or less an idea of what when, once you break down natural language processing, then what are you expecting to do with language? So you can perform any of these tasks. And one of the resources or one of the ways that you can improve your natural language processing uh, adventures, or even this can be a line of research on its own, is working with knowledge repositories or knowledge bases. Um, the terminology is a little bit fuzzy, so it's not the knowledge base has been used as a term to define many different uh, types of databases and knowledge repositories uh, along the time. Along the time. But well, let, let's just say that you know, uh, it's a graph-like data structure where nodes are concepts, entities, and edges, arcs between them, and called relations. Relations can be semantic, they can be ontology, like uh, Barack Obama is president of, what well, was president of uh, uh, United States, and so on. No? It is, this is an example that has been used like forever, so even 10 years. Like Alright, so anyway, KDs are essential for AI, because they can provide you with a ground of knowledge that then your system can take advantage of to uh, maybe uh, in, be used in, in web search engines, yeah, like a classic, classic case. And they can be uh, constructed manually or uh, automatically, and our preference is to do algorithms to do them automatic automatically, especially because there are fields in, in, in science and, 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 and culture that uh, evolve so fast that it's not feasible to have knowledge engineers updating them uh, manually. So if you have an algorithm that is able to read the web, read what is going on, and update the knowledge base automatically, you're saving a lot of time and probably having at least as good their, your results as you would have with, with human engineers. Um, types of knowledge bases, as I said, this is a loose definition like, like, like uh, custom for knowledge bases, so I included WordNet as one, but well, well, those who know WordNet is a lexical database, so strictly speaking it's not a, uh, a knowledge base, but well, we can make do with that definition. SNOMED is a, uh, another medical terminology for on, on in, the, in the medical domain. Uh, there are integrative projects, so, so systems whose aim is to put together in one single resource automatically manually constructed resources. Uh, one of uh, the best known uh, systems is, at least to my knowledge, is Babelnet, which was originally a, a mapping between Wikipedia and WordNet, but now it includes many domain specific terminologies and other resources, Wikidata, Omega, Omega Wiki, Wiktionary, etc. <coughs> Just as a side note, there's a whole line of research in, in artificial intelligence called open information extraction. This is machine reading. You have a system that goes online and reads stuff and extracts facts. And whenever it's, uh, these facts are beyond a certain threshold, they are incorporated to the, to the, to the knowledge base. Nell from Carnegie Mellon University, Patty, Wise, Nell, Defi, or Phoebe Unify are some examples. Nell even has a Twitter bot, a user, automatic user that throws away Fax says, I read this. Do you agree with this? Should I incorporate this to the knowledge base? And depending on what people reply to this tweet, then the bot uh, tells the system whether to include this to the, to, the, to the system. It's been running 24 7 since 2010. And uh, yeah, it's kind of a reference work in open information extraction. Yeah, and there are music knowledge bases. Of course, not many, but there are a few. Uh, music Brains and Disco GS are two. Uh, <coughs> well-known uh, resources, they are open encyclopedias of music metadata, and importantly, also for the sake of this presentation, Music Brains is regularly published as linked data by the Link Brains project. There's the group Music Online Encyclopedia, although in this case the information is more uh, uh, inclined towards the scholar, towards scholarly information. And there's also a flamenco music knowledge base that was developed in the, in the MTG, no? 
And, um, and I guess that's it. So until here, uh, big picture without too much detail about natural language processing. We've left a lot of links to software tools, libraries, Python references. So yeah, uh, I don't think we should take questions like throughout the presentation. If you guys have questions, maybe before the break or at the end. No? Thank you.